I guess everybody's here. We can get started. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I want to uh, thank everyone for your attendance. And uh, definitely, if I would have known we would have had this much ease of having a quorum of the board, we would have done a special meeting because I do think this is important. And certainly see all of you holding this as real special and important as well. Um, so in the future, Jim, we'll have a topic of discussion around COVID-19 and we're going to get some fun attendance. Um, good afternoon, all of you. I now call to order today's first meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on Post-Pandemic Operations. Members, thank you for agreeing to serve on this special committee during this time. And I also welcome our presidents who will have an active role in our discussion today. As we begin this afternoon, Carol, would you please call the committee roll? Mr. Romero? Here. Mr. Carter? Here. Dr. Clark? Here. Ms. Donahoe? Present. Dr. Egan? Mr. Kitchen? Mr. Kitchen? Mr. Murphy? So, sorry, uh, Carol, I had it on mute on here. Okay. Um, Mr. Murphy? Mr. Perkins? Here. Ms. Pierre? Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Salter? Um, I, yes, we have a quorum. Carol, I'm here. I, I don't know if I, if I didn't yell out loud, condos. Thank you, Carol. And uh, I know Sean Murphy is attempting to, to dial in, uh, Mr. Chairman. Sure. And Ms. Lodiger's here, I see. Yeah, I also want to note there are additional board members in attendance. And I want to uh, thank you for taking your time to join us. I do think that this is very important work. Uh, our system president, as well as the presidents of the university campuses, and our team uh, have been working very diligently to bring some good guidance and discussion points for us today. So again, welcome all of you. Uh, in consideration of the fact that we're meeting virtually, and in order to proceed with today's meeting, I'll need a motion in the second to accept the certificate of inability to operate due to compliance with the directives of the governor, the CDC, and the local and state governing health authorities and officials. So moved. Moved by Ms. Donahoe. Second. Second by Dr. Clark. Carol, if you could please call the roll. Mr. Romero? Yes. Mr. Carter? Yes. Dr. Clark? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Dr. Egan? Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Mr. Perkins? Yes. Ms. Pierre? Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Salter? Um, th there's a quorum of that. That motion's motion passed. Carol, if you don't mind, Jim, if it would be appropriate, let's uh, allow the vote like we do as committee as a whole of the other members present. Carol, if you would. Right. That's Ms. Lodiger, Ms. Methvin, and Dr. Condos. Yes. Ms. Ms. Uh, Lodiger, do you want to vote on that? Yes, and I vote yes. Certificate. Ms. Methvin? Yes, I vote. Yes. And Dr. Condos? Dr. Condos? Well, the motion is passed. Thank you, Carol. I'd like to advise you that the content of today's Zoom meeting, including chat, is being recorded and subject to public records requests. So please keep that in mind as we conduct business today. To those who are viewing via Zoom, be reminded that anyone who wishes to make a public comment must send a chat message to the moderator. In the message, please include your first and last names, affiliation, as well as the item number in which you want to comment. You'll be allowed to share your video audio at the appropriate time, or your comment can be read by a system staff member. Please email publiccomment at ulsystem.edu. That is Comments will be limited to three minutes. Dr. Henderson, if you would, uh, please open up the discussion today for us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And to board members, thank you for, for joining us uh, for this conversation. And I hope that it is a, a conversation. Um, 
it, I would be remiss if, if I didn't take every opportunity to applaud and, and express gratitude to our faculty or staff and of course our university presidents uh, uh, who did the impossible so that nearly 18,000 students could graduate this year. This, this, this semester alone, it was almost 10,000 students. Uh, one of them is our, is our board member, Rachel Lodiger. And Rachel, just let me say uh, in an official meeting, congratulations on being a graduate of the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. So thank you so Cajuns much. and congratulations on that. Uh, what you did, and, and by extension, the, the other 9,900 and some odd students is, is a, uh, the moment it's remarkable, it deserves our praise, but number two, for those of us who have graduated many, many years ago, it should give us a great sense of optimism, because the resilience and the determination that, that, that was reflected in your generation is something that I'll, I'll draw inspiration from for a long time, so congratulations. Um, but, but Mr. Chairman, as, as you know, we are in, and uh, I will say it's an unprecedented circumstance. Of course, we faced pandemic, we faced infection before, but nothing in this, to this degree in the circumstance that we find ourselves in terms of the way society works, the way education works, the way colleges and universities work. And so in a lot of ways, we're in uncharted territory. I, uh, I will tell you that that the work we have done at the system level, and certainly the work that is doing, being done every single day amongst our leadership at our campuses, is totally focused on returning to whatever this new normal will be as quickly as possible. That said, we're trying to do so in a way that, that makes sense, that is safe, that, that helps it, it, it advance our mission. And to do that, at least my approach to that is is always with frameworks, right? Starting with what are the core principles? What are the things that we believe in? What are the things that are going to govern who we are and the way that we work and the way that we proceed? And and we're going to go through a presentation um, that I think captures a lot of that. It describes the framework and guidelines that all of our institutions are operating under. Uh, and, and there's, some, there's some key things that I want you to take away from that. One, and Dr. Fauci, I think, said it quite well uh, in his last remarks about schools coming back into session this fall, is that location and demography, demographics, matter. There is no one size fits all. And as you know, we approach our work as a, as a system of nine very distinct institutions that each has its own history, its own mission, its own program mix, its own culture, if you will. And we do things systemically where it makes sense, but we always do things so that our universities can respond best to their university communities. And that's no different than where we are today. They serve different types of students in different settings in different communities. And, and so these guidelines, I think, allow us to have some consistency across a system where it makes a great deal of sense where you as board members can have uh, security knowing that your fiduciary, your strategic and your generative uh, governance roles are being fulfilled and allows our presidents and their university communities and their faculty to deliver uh, to students in, in, a, in a way that, that, that can make us all proud. But as we do that, uh, we start with some guiding principles. And amongst those guiding principles, we, we've, we've identified four. And we've identified them and we've listed them in, in, a, in a hierarchy, right? That, that, that each of the four, that, that, that you start with the first premise, which is the health and safety of students, faculty, staff, and our communities is absolutely paramount. That's principle number one. And the other three flow from that. The second one is the continuity of learning and research and how it must be maintained. And, and we have to adapt to fulfill principle one as appropriate necessary as we deliver on principle two. Principle three is, is, is the financial health and viability of the enterprise must be protected. And that financial health is, in my opinion, determined by our fulfillment of principle one and two. And of course, principle four is this broader societal, this social, emotional, and economic welfare of our communities, which are so highly dependent upon our institutions. 
if we allow those four principles to govern all planning that we conduct, all decisions that we make, and all the actions taken by our institutions, then we're going to do a lot of things right. But that's a pretty high level right there. And if we don't focus at a, at, at a, uh, a level beneath that, one that gets a little bit more granular, then we're going to fall short. And so what we have developed are some guidelines um, based on the phases of reopening. As you know, we're in phase one of reopening. And these phases come from uh, the, the, the federal government, the White House plan for reopening the economy, reopen, reopening our states. Certainly, we are uh, blessed to have, leading the state of Louisiana, uh, one of the finest crisis leaders I've ever seen in action in Governor John Bell Edwards. And he has declared us to be in phase one. We hope that in the coming days, maybe the coming weeks, we'll be in phase two. And by the time we open our, our institutions in the fall for the fall semester, we hope to be in phase three. Uh, that depends on nature and science cooperating with us. So I wanna walk through our work on each of the phases, and then we're gonna bring our staff to the table and talk about kind of this nerve center approach, if you will, to leadership and management of these institutions as, as we go forward through this. And so in phase one, we've, uh, uh, we've defined that, that telework for non-essential employees. And this is, uh, we're gonna take a little bit of time and, and I hope you'll, 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 you'll uh, indulge me as we go through this. We're gonna define some terms uh, and one of them is non-essential uh, because it, it, it does have a connotation that is not at all what it means in this context. A non-essential employee is an employee whose physical presence is not required during an emergency or during a situation, right? Uh, an employee, that classification is essential or non-essential can change in accordance with the type of emergency or the stage of emergency response. But in phase one, telework of, of non-essential employees should be strongly encouraged, if not mandated. And you will see that at, at the system office, we have a, a, a number of staff are continuing to telework and they're doing so in a way that I think is uh, 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 maybe troublingly increasing productivity. We'll figure that out. I think all of us are experiencing some of that as well. Uh, if employees need to return to work, it should be done in phases. And some of our schools are already uh, implementing this work as we speak. Returning those essential employees to work in phases with appropriate social distancing protocols, closing common areas, um, in-person classes and labs should be restricted to 10 or fewer including instructors with strict adherence to social distancing guidelines. All of these recommendations are coming or recommended to us from uh, public health officials at both the federal level and at the state. that have applications arising from the virus, uh, but we're also strongly uh, uh, concerned with those employees, those students, those faculty, those staff who are required to routinely be in the presence of a member of a vulnerable population. Uh, we're still in a, in a phase where we are trying to stem the growth of this virus and its impact on our society. And so our discretion uh, in working with those populations is absolutely essential. As we move into phase two, we do start to see a little change in, in our disposition. Uh, we, we still strongly believe that telework should remain an option for non-essential employees, and that those that have to come back to work should again be done in, in phases with appropriate social distancing protocols. Uh, In-person classes and labs should be restricted to 50% of the fire marshal's maximum occupancy with strict adherence to social distancing guidelines. I'm gonna stop on this point for, for one minute. You, you may have seen uh, guidance that says, uh, that limits gatherings to 50 or fewer people. And I wanna distinguish between social gatherings and instructional gatherings. In a social gathering, I'm, I'm thinking about a wedding reception or, or, or other things where you'll see people in close proximity engaging in social activities. Uh, through our work with, with uh, the Board of Regents, the Department of Health and Hospitals, we've determined that 50% of the fire marshal's occupancy, as long as it allows for social distancing guidelines to be put in place, desk spaced apart, 
uh, the use of personal protective equipment, then that does adhere to the latest guidance from CDC and others. Again, special accommodations for students, faculty, and staff who are part of the vulnerable populations or routinely in the presence of a member of a vulnerable population are required. As we move into phase three, this is when we can look forward to returning to, well, nearly pre-pandemic operations. Uh, social distancing is going to be with us for quite some time. The occupancy provisions are, are going to be based on recommendations from the CDC. Uh, that's still an evolving recommendation, so we, we, we don't quite have what that is yet. Uh, I, in my opinion, it will be very close to what it is in phase two with that 50 percent uh, occupancy, but I don't want to get ahead of the science on that. Uh, we want the university we're flexible in case we need to return to phase one or phase two or God forbid the stay at home order. Uh, but, but phase three does allow us to return to, to some sense of normalcy. We still believe that special accommodations for those students, those faculty and staff or members of vulnerable populations uh, who, are, who are, are required to be in the presence of a member of a vulnerable population should be strongly considered and implemented whenever practicable. Now, beyond that, we still have the safeguards, protections, and the guidance with, from the Americans with Disabilities Act and, uh, uh, and other regulations that allow us to accommodate those students and those employees as necessary. Uh, this is in addition to those standard precautions uh, that will follow. Um, as we move into this nerve center piece, uh, this is an approach to, to leadership, to management that, 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 that has, has emerged in the science, if you will, as a structural approach to leading in crisis and leading in, into these types of scenarios. Uh, we have adapted that to really look at COVID-19 as an ecosystem in and of itself and have split off the, 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 the planning and the response to that to teams associated with the key areas of our operation for students, faculty, staff, teaching and research, campus operations, external communication, finance, and legal. I want to walk through, if you will, with staff uh, uh, guidance or planning uh, protocols for each of these areas. And we're going to start, as, as we should, uh, with students. And I would like to turn then the, the microphone over to, to Erica Calais, our Vice President of Student Services. Erica? Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Students will have to be re reassured that their respective campuses are making their health and well-being a priority. Students and parents alike need to know what precautionary measures the campus is taking to ensure that the campus is safe for re-entry. Post-pandemic support services should be available to students through multiple platforms, face-to-face -face and virtually, when appropriate to increase their availability. Ways in which international students can be supported and accommodated should be identified. Campuses should assess student needs when it comes to hardware and internet services. Ways in which those needs can be addressed should be identified. In regards to academics, flexibility should be provided so that time to degree is not negatively impacted while not diluting the integrity of the degree. When allowances are made, data should be collected and evaluated to see if there is merit to changing existing academic policy. One major area of concern for students and parents in the fall will be the health and well being of the students while on campus. Just yesterday, I received an email from a concerned parent regarding her daughter's return to campus. She wanted to know how the campus planned on ensuring that social distancing was maintained in dorms. As well, she expressed concerns about how students who contracted the virus would be quarantined. And of course, all of her concerns are warranted. Again, reassuring parents and students about protocols in place to keep students healthy and safe will be critical. I would like to ask Ms. Geisman to speak some about the messaging that will go out to campus communities regarding health and safety. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Um, I'll have more to share on the uh, communication later, both external and internal, but 
Erica's right. It, it's going to be vital that we continue frequent messaging throughout the summer by updating students of the plans and set expectations for the fall. Um, and right now, our primary channels for these messages are digital, you know, email, social media, and text. And um, the messages um, will emphasize our guiding principles of health and safety and con con continuity of instruction. But uh, we should also encourage flexibility because as we've learned um, with this virus, what is true one day may not be later. So we wanna make sure students understand that this remains a dynamic situation and adaptability in this fall is gonna be key. And once we are back on campus, communication will really shift to include increased physical messages about uh, community expectations, including signage about physical distancing, hygiene, uh, building flow changes, such as limiting doors to entrance only or exit only and things like that. Um, but to set expectations is, uh, is vital that students understand the various changes from normal operations that will exist and parents. Thank you, Ms. Geisman. Another concern of the students will be support services. Students will want to know what that will look like, whether they are taking classes on campus or online. Currently, most support services such as financial aid, mental health, disability services can be provided online. During the fall, the campuses could continue offering these services online when appropriate for those students who prefer to have limited face-to-face -face interactions. As well, offering these services online will increase the availability of these services. For example, universities will face an increased demand for mental health support. Counseling centers are preparing for an uptick in students needing counseling. Our institutions have made adjustments by offering telecounseling service, services and will continue to make adjustments to accommodate high demand. As well, health centers are considering adjusting their hours in order to adequately accommodate students. In the area of disability services, Consideration is being given to other ways students can register for services. In terms of overall student support, we are confident that our institutions will do their due diligence in accommodating students, even if, even if it means making adjustments to past practices. There will also be some measures put in place to support international students, and I would like to ask Mr. Jones to speak to that. Uh, thank you, Erica. So, so our international students face a unique set of circumstances related to COVID-19. Uh, some of them rushed back uh, to their home countries before flights were canceled or national government shut down borders. Currently, there's still uncertainty about the coming academic year uh, and how it would look for international students. Uh, some who went home are not sure if they will be allowed to enter the U.S., especially if they are returning from countries uh, whose COVID-19 numbers are still rising. Some students may still face practical problems in their home countries, uh, like a lack of internet access. And for those uh, of our students who return to places like China, for instance, they may have found that their American online classes were blocked by China's censors. Uh, it is hard for them to get, in, to get onto American websites when in China and access to school emails may be difficult. For those students who stayed, many of them had little to no experience with online classes because of the nature of the visa that they came to the U.S. under and therefore may have struggled to switch to online delivery. Additionally, many of them face some of the same COVID-19 related expenses as domestic students. However, international students were not eligible to receive any of the financial support under the CARES Act. Now, as our institutions uh, transition back to uh, on-campus life, hopefully they will explore creative ways to meet the financial, educational, and emotional needs of the international, uh, international students enrolled, whether these uh, students are returning to campus or uh, they are forced to continue their education online because of the inability to return to the U.S. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, Marcus. As I mentioned, there will also be some processes put in place related to academic process and technical support. And I would like to ask Dr. Khan to provide you with some details. 
Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon to everyone. It's good to see everyone, um, albeit via Zoom and in very small boxes. <laughs> um, as students are invited to return to campus this fall, plans need to be put in place to provide support relevant to reliable and sustainable hardware and technology for online learning. As we can all imagine as our campuses prepare for fall 2020, uh, there'll be more online delivery of instruction than there has been in the past to deal with um, constraints put forth by CDC recommendations in regards to COVID-19. The pandemic has certainly highlighted the digital divide that exists when it comes to access or, or lack thereof to technology. To ensure student success, campuses must identify those students in need and assist them with solutions such as establishing a laptop loaner program, providing hotspots, for internet access and so on. In regards to course offerings and degree requirements, the expectation is that campuses will work to create a more flexible culture so that unintended barriers resulting from COVID-19 do not impede academic progress. For example, if a student is scheduled to graduate but does not have access to a course required of his or her major um, due to um, shifting in schedules uh, as a result of COVID-19, um, the campus should make concessions to see about uh, exploring a course substitution, of course, without in, um, diluting the integrity of the degree. The key word there is we must be flexible to help our students. Policy requirements and practices may need to be adjusted in order to ensure that time to degree is not negatively impacted by circumstances that have resulted at no fault to the student. And lastly, as our campus has made concessions when it comes to admissions and placement, et cetera, for fall 2020, to accommodate those students that did not or were not able to take the ACT or the SAT, um, we must capture data to see how these students progress that we can determine that in the future, maybe there are policy changes that need to be made in regards to uh, minimum admission standards and so on. To this point, I'm going to ask Dr. Claire Norris to please go over what she and the, the campus IR staff have been discussing uh, pertaining to this uh, specific, specific topic. Thanks, Dr. Khan. So as it's been emphasized again and again, we recognize that this is a pretty dynamic situation and it's going to require constant data management and maintenance. And so the IR team is really using the four principles that were set forth in this document um, to guide our data discussions, collections, analysis, and reporting. As Dr. Khan said, we're, we're asking questions um, about the, the COVID-19 policy changes um, around admissions and, and placement and how that will impact uh, our incoming freshmen. Um, as you guys probably know, there's always been a lot of discussion about the value of standardized testing um, uh, for admission and, and placement purposes. But we intend to be ahead of that, tracking um, those measures to, to help us to be in a place where we can contribute to good future policy work. Uh, the next area that we're going to focus on um, is our faculty and our staff. Do Dr. Khan, mm -hmm. yes. my, my apologies. I think Dr. Henderson wanted to say a little more about Perfect. counseling. Yes. Absolutely. And, and members, and I apologize to interrupt the, the flow of the, 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 the conversation because the, the, they're showing you the, the breadth and depth of how many things we have to consider. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk a minute about counseling services. We've been talking as a, as a body uh, for years now about how important those services have become on our campuses. But one of the untold stories about COVID-19 is not just how counseling services were moved into virtual settings almost flawlessly. It's the way they extended their reach to their communities. They became oasis of, of support and services far beyond the university community itself. Uh, these are some of the stories that I hope we'll be able to capture and tell in a way that is, is worthy of the service. Uh, but the professionals that we have in our counseling services around the state uh, are belong in that category of heroes that we've been celebrating with first responders. Uh, and I just wanted to make that point because uh, they're certainly worthy of our praise and gratitude. So sorry to interrupt, Eric. An extremely important point. As we all know, mental health um, is a challenge for not only our campus communities, but the community at large. And this is certainly the case um, as we're dealing with such uh, uh, challenges during the COVID-19. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Henderson. Uh, we will now move to our faculty and staff in that, that area of focus. 
Um, of course, ensuring the health, safety, and welfare of our faculty and staff is a highest priority. With that in mind, return, uh, phased in return to campus plans and policies must call for appropriate workforce conditions, as well as provide accommodations for those who are not able to return to campus to fulfill their duties. Temporary alternatives to on-site work should be provided for those members of vulnerable populations and HR policies need to remain flexible as we attempt to instate residential delivery systems alongside ongoing remote delivery of instruction and services to our students. To ensure that faculty and staff are able, able to provide remote instructions, working from home, et cetera, um, we need to assess, our campuses need to assess again, very similar to the student needs, what the needs are when it comes to hardware and internet access for our faculty and our staff, and to find out ways and identify ways to provide them with the support they need in order to serve, it, serve their institution and the students that enroll. Expectations when it comes to self-monitoring and other guidelines specific to COVID-19, such as self-distancing, wearing a PPE, and so on, should be clearly conveyed to faculty and staff. It is extremely important to communicate and communicate often about reopening plans, as well as to listen to the voices of faculty and staff so that their opinions are, and insight are taken into consideration. It should be strongly encouraged that meetings with internal and external constituents be conducted virtually when possible throughout the early phases so as to mitigate risk. And thankfully, we have things such as Zoom and, and WebEx and other platforms that allow for us to continue our work um, as we've done um, since March. The next area that I'll go into is teaching and research. This is, of course, at the heart of what our campuses do. It's why we're here. Uh, when planning for and implementing a new mode of operation, again, I've said flexibility probably a hundred times is key. Flexibility should be paramount while keeping the core academic mission at the forefront. A wide range of course delivery modalities, including face-to-face, -face, hybrid, remote, um, high flex, and so on, will need to be utilized in order to provide continuous instruction and learning in light of CD CDC requirements such as social, social distancing, and the occupation regulations that Dr. Henderson um, mentioned uh, when we first began this meeting. This will require ongoing training and development for our faculty to ensure online teaching skills are at their best, assessment of learning objectives is optimal, and technology is leveraged accordingly. Cultures that support instructional creativity, residential and or remote, and reflect the ac academic integrity of program offerings will need to be supported. In addition, faculty will need to provide students with the assurance that the quality and viability of their coursework reflects a continued commitment to student learning, success, and degree completion. In regard to research, policy may need to be adjusted to address this, the, the disruption that has occurred and most likely will continue for quite some time due to COVID-19. Operational plans for restarting on-campus research and field work must be established with a focus on protecting the health and safety of our faculty, staff, and students. And strong communication with public and private partners should occur so that relationships are not diminished and there may be new partnerships to explore as a result of what we learn from this pandemic. Of course, our campuses will not need to navigate this pandemic path alone. System initiatives are underway, which have been designed to assist our campuses, as well as to leverage the collective brain power of our faculty and staff in order to benefit our teaching and learning that's occurring on our campuses. Um, at this time, I'd like Dr. Norris to please share some information about what, uh, with the ad hoc committee, about what current efforts are underway um, by the and with the Digital Equity and Inclusion Task Force. Sure, sure. I believe that at our last um, board meeting, I mentioned to um, you guys that the UL system has established a digital equity and inclusion task force. The primary goal of the task force is to identify and eliminate areas of digital inequities to ensure equitable teaching and learning experiences across the UL system. So there were four areas that we identified as critical components to this work, and that's access to technology, um, building and maintaining a robust learning uh, online learning infrastructure, ensuring digital um, and technology uh, literacy, and removing interpersonal barriers. So I'm excited to inform you that last week we were notified that our system was awarded $186,000 in GEAR funding. 
um, to support this work. So we're in the process of creating um, a professional online platform um, that gives all of our faculty um, equal access to uh, professional development in teaching and learning. Again, putting equity um, at the forefront of this initiative. And so the professional development areas include uh, technology and tools for online learning. So um, advancements are uh, professional development in the areas of our learning management system, quality matters. Um, you know, I, I think many of our faculty, faculty would um, argue that online learning infrastructure starts from the premise that quality and equity are linked. Um, and so um, the third area is uh, in a, innovation and engaging uh, course content. And then finally, equity and inclusion, making sure that all of our students um, have um, equitable learning experiences um, throughout the next, the upcoming semesters. Thank you, Claire. It's been some really innovative and fast-paced work, and we have some very talented members of, of the um, group from all of our campuses that have been in, very engaged. And so, uh, was it Winston Churchill, I think, that said, out of uh, chaos comes good, or um, I'm just quote paraphrasing. And so, this is going to be some work that not only are we, are we dealing with currently to deal with the pandemic, but also will help shape work to improve what we're doing for years to come. And so I applaud that group for all the work that they do and are, will be doing and continue to do. In regards to research, campus representatives will be coming together virtually next week in order to develop a common model and consistent approach for the assessment of COVID-19 impacts on the research enterprise of the UL system. This collective conversation will assist in rolling up this information at the system level so that we can respond quickly and as a whole, rather than individual institutions, uh, to uh, respond quickly to any opportunities that arise, which would allow for compensating universities uh, for lost research revenues, very similar to something as a CARES Act. And so not only are we looking to help um, support um, our campuses um, in the area of teaching, but also in the area of research. Um, knowing that our educators must educate and our research must, researchers must move forward with their work, even during challenging times and a very unchartered uh, course, we will continue to find ways here at the UL system to work with our campuses and bring them together so that they can benefit from each other um, and continue on uh, with this, this push toward our new normal. And Marcus, I think you're up. Okay, uh, so the next area is campus operations. Now the health and safety of the students, faculty, staff, and visitors are paramount when planning a return to post-pandemic campus operations. Public health issues caused by the virus must be addressed in a manner that permits easing physical distancing practices and the resumption of many of the activities and educational experiences of a vibrant campus. Now with input from key stakeholders like HR, which uh, again would provide input uh, concerning employees, uh, employee issues and needs, uh, IT, which will, will help with providing input on security and access, uh, university police uh, would provide uh, input on campus access, business affairs, athletics and housing partners. The campus incident command group should be the driving force behind a safety focused and medically informed plan to resume campus operations. The plan should include a guide to return to normal operations and a contingency plan in the event of a spike in COVID-19 cases after campus operations have fully resumed. Finally, most of our institutions already have a plan. However, at a minimum, any plan that's developed should incorporate some of the following things. Uh, one is protecting and supporting the health, safety, and welfare of our faculty, staff, and students. Uh, two, maintaining business and administrative operations. Uh, three, recovering as quickly as and efficiently as possible if any operations are interrupted or suspended. Uh, fourth is establishing triggers to prompt prudent actions in the event of a positive COVID case on campus. And then finally, ensuring clear communications with uh, students, faculty, staff, parents, and stakeholders. All of the, the uh, as I said, uh, uh, I think all the institutions probably have plans already in place, but uh, 
all the plans should make sure that they uh, they include some of the uh, the things that I just mentioned. And Janine, I think, um, Cammy, I believe. I was going to call. All right. Um, first, I would uh, like to commend our university communications teams and our presidents for the incredible work they have done throughout this event. Maintaining such a high level of communication with the appropriate tone while navigating uncharted waters is exceedingly difficult and taxing. And I'm so proud of their efforts and, and they re really should be commended. Um, but increased communication is necessary in times of crisis. And though we are beyond the height of the crisis, there will still be a need for consistent communication with internal and external stakeholders. Not only will new campus protocols such as dis distancing practices and gatherings restrictions need to be communicated, but also messages about increased hygiene and provisions for vulnerable populations to ensure the community at large feels comfortable with plans to return to campus. Internal communication channels, traditional message, uh, media, and social media provide myriad opportunities to share message, messages and institutional stories. Social media should be used beyond its capacity to send messages but also for its um, capacity to listen to, to constituencies and ensure common themes are addressed through monitoring and response. And, so and we've- Amy, I, If I could interrupt you there, you know, there, a lot of us are, are active on social media uh, now. And, and, you know, I know some of us, uh, Mr. Perkins is, is probably the, the, the expert on Facebook. I, I tend to lean towards Twitter uh, Cam and her ilk uh, go for these newfangled things like Instagram and TikTok and stuff. I'm it's way too vital, old for TikTok. Yeah, it's a it's a vital, it's a vital tool, not just in the formal way of communicating, but just to stay in touch. Uh, especially with fact, I'm, I'm I happen to uh, to be uh, associated with a number of faculty across the state on on Twitter, and uh, and and you know I see the angst, I see the concern, I see the ideas that come across. Uh, from and, and the wisdom that comes across there, the caring, it, it is a tremendous resource and it's one that we have to figure out how to leverage uh, even more effectively than we do. I, uh, 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 we've got a lot of, we've got 8,000 wise voices out there and amongst our faculty and staff at these campuses and finding new ways to listen and to leverage that collective intellectual capacity, if you will, uh, to, to do things the right way is going to be essential. And so I, did, I just want to make that point, Kimmy. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no worries. And I, I completely agree in listening to those constituencies and, and, and addressing those common themes through monitoring and response is going to be vital in the coming months. So we've identified four common messaging themes that should be consistent. And those are the uh, really our guiding principles, the health and safety of our communities, the, um, ed our educational mission, uh, safely engaging in the university experience. It's really important to, to all of us that we um, get back to campus this fall if safe. And so um, the way we can continue that university experience in a safe manner is important to, to convey. And then of course, flexibility. Um, we think it is important to continue to update our state and local leaders of plans and expectations of the fall semester. This will help as they receive questions from their constituents, but also help as they make decisions that may imp impact our uh, institutions in the future. And of course, we'll continue to use media relations as a way to communicate with our local and regional communities. And it's vital that we maintain those relationships so we can call on them as we have relevant information to share. Um, and um, communication, both internal and external, is vital and should be emphasized as the uh, fall plans are contemplated. And Kami, you know, establishing those expectations for folks is 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 vital. You know, I said it in an interview recently that 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 fall 2020 is not going to look like spring 2020, the last half of spring 2020. It it's also going to look decidedly different than fall 2019. And anyone that denies that is just not paying attention to the reality. We cannot adhere to those four governing principles and expect to return to normal operations. And that's why this planning process, one, the guidelines we establish here, but most importantly, that work that's being done as we speak on our campuses is, is so vital. Uh, and so uh, communicating that effectively internally and externally is, is absolutely essential. So sorry, Kim. 
No, that, thank you. I think that was a, a good ending. Um, and um, I think we're going to head to Marcus for some finance stuff, unless you'd like okay. me to handle the finance piece, Marcus. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think the, uh, the CFOs will, will probably say this is probably most, the most important part of the, uh, the presentation, which is the finance piece. Uh, so the, the institution's financial health is at the forefront of any transition back to campus operations. Uh, finance interacts with all university operations and support services, including student financial aid, uh, records and registration, the bursar's office, uh, receipts and disbursements, sponsor programs, auxiliary services, HR, and many others. Of significant concern is the university's role in assisting students with financial needs while ensuring the university's fiscal health. Because of the uniqueness of the situation, university leadership has to ensure compliance with all laws and regulations affecting the reopening of the campuses while, the, uh, while keeping the health and well-being of students, faculty, and staff in mind. Additionally, campus administrators must adhere to strict guidelines regarding the use of the CARES Act funds they receive. While weighing the interests of the many different stakeholders, it would be the finance area's role to, the, to develop financial models and monitor student enrollment on, the, on an ongoing basis. The finance area must ensure compliance with the various debt covenants, uh, compliance with contracts and payrolls, all to ensure the institution's future fiscal health. Developing reasonable budgets and developing flexible financial plans responsive to changing environments, this will be required to ensure future stability post uh, COVID-19. And Dr. Henderson, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, Marcus, I appreciate that. And staff, thank you for, for walking through those, those components of, of our framework. It's very important, of course, uh, members, that's not an exhaustive list of, of things for us to talk about, and and it and it continues uh, to evolve. We've had evolving guidance from CDC. I think it was as as early as nine weeks ago. We were told that there's no reason for a healthy person to wear a mask, and now uh, masks are are recommended. In fact, we'll uh, likely be requiring them uh, at least through phase two, and strongly recommend them, if not requiring them in in the classroom. Uh, through phase three, or until a vaccine is 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 made available, uh, that's actually the recommendation that I heard most recently from public health officials. It's still, again, it's evolving uh, guidance that they're giving us. You know, we talk a lot about testing and, and the testing environment, and, and some schools that have planned to test everyone that comes back. Yet the rapid test that we would typically use for that only tells you if you're actively shedding virus. It doesn't necessarily tell you if you've had it. It tells you if you, it might tell you if you have antibodies, uh, but there's questions about even using uh, the rapid test and how well that will, if that makes sense. CDC again and other public health officials are working through that guidance as well. We'll continue to stay very, very closely in touch with them. Uh, right now, they're, not, they're likely not going to recommend that everyone gets a test, but it does mean that we're gonna have testing on our, our campuses because identification of outbreaks is absolutely critical if you're going to stem outbreaks. And, and we're working through protocols on how you could do remote testing uh, and how you can, uh, 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 for instance, a health center can actually bring a test to a student and in a safe way, maybe leave a test outside the door, saliva test, if you will, while that student is quarantined. All of these are the, the this is how granular this planning becomes. We've got to have you know, accommodations for faculty, uh, the, the use of PPE, outbreak response, isolation quarters, quarantining practices, contact tracing, uh, course modalities. All of these are part of the things that, we're, that we have to talk through. Uh, as we go through these adjustments, you know, the schools have got to pay attention to employee handbooks, uh, work with faculty on faculty handbooks, the student codes of conduct, to ensure that in all of these places that we assemble our protocols and our rules and regulations, that we're putting those in place, that our planning team are, are affected, our response teams are responsive. Uh, you know, talk about refund policies. What happens if we enter the middle of the semester again and, 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 and we have to, to do a stay at home order or stay at home order becomes prevalent? You know, we should be planning these things out now so that we're not scrambling like we had to in the spring. Uh, 
And as I said early on, while these guidelines can, can, can be instructive, they can be supportive, they can be helpful, and they can certainly uh, help the board understand what's going on, the response at each institution is going to vary. Again, it's going to vary based on location. It's going to vary based on demographics. I'd, I'd like, uh, I know John Nicklow is on the, on, on the phone. And of course, John, uh, University of New Orleans, is in the epicenter of the COVID-19 and, and its impact on, on Louisiana. Uh, he also happens to be in a community that has seven, I believe, four-year institutions, uh, only one of which is in our system, uh, but they have to work collaboratively. They have to uh, work with uh, uh, the city of New Orleans and, and, and uh, uh, as they coordinate their response. So John, I'd, I'd like for you, if you would, to speak specifically about uh, your approach at UNO and how that coordinates with that, that city governance and your, and your peer institutions in New Orleans. Certainly. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. And good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you virtually. Um, all of our planning has, has really followed the guiding principles that were laid out to you. Uh, but in particular, uh, we, the, the top priority is the health and safety of our campus community. Um, and then secondarily, business continuity, uh, meaning that meaningful learning and, and uh, research have to continue. We also recognize through all, the, all of this that we're not going to change the biology of the, the virus, but what we can do is change behaviors and change practices, and that that's what we need to focus on a, a, as a campus. I've worked hard with our task force to create a return to campus guide that is unique to UNO. Uh, it lives on our internal intranet because of the information is changing so rapidly. Um, we have make updates to that document literally every day. Um, our emphasis was on creating a, a very concise document with clear and actionable information for the campus. And I, as I look at plans all around the country, they get very um, detailed, very long, and, and it's sometimes difficult to find the clear and actionable information that, that, that we sought. Um, so that was one of our objectives. It addresses the six areas of focus and follows the guidance and restrictions of the CDC, the White House, the state, and then of course the stricter uh, New Orleans uh, criteria, uh, which is a four-phased reopening approach. We created a plan, as Dr. Henderson said, in uh, collaboration with the presidents and chancellors from the other seven four-year institutions and the two two-year colleges in the area. Uh, we meet regularly, probably every 10, 10 days or so, uh, to update each other and make sure that we're somewhat consistent, um, that, that we're all relatively aligned. We're all different and serve different populations, but we are on the same area, and so there ought to be some consistency there, as well as the city. Um, and I, was, uh, I served on the mayor's coordinating committee on the response to COVID-19, representing higher ed, and now I'm uh, representing higher ed on a working group. Uh, for reopening. So we have a direct line to the mayor's office and, and changes coming out of that. Our plan is four phases uh, of return, A through D. We're currently running in phase A and really just bringing back some researchers. But again, in the fall, we hope to be in phase uh, C or D uh, by, uh, by August uh, 19th is which, when we start fall semester. Our fall instruction uh, planning is really based on, uh, I'm a beach lover, so we went with a green flag, yellow flag, red flag uh, approach, depending on the virus and tr trends. And uh, of course, a green flag scenario is face-to-face, -face. things are, uh, are fairly normal, probably with some, some flexibility built in, <clears throat> and that red flag is, is fully remote. And we've set it, we've established protocols so that we could pivot relatively quickly um, between those, and with more planning <laughs> and, uh, uh, going forward than we had in the, in the spring. We are reworking all of our classroom infrastructure, the sizes of the spaces to ensure social distancing. We have hand sanitizing stations and plexiglass shields that are being put up this week all over the place um, in, in buildings and offices. We do expect students and faculty to wear masks uh, in, in public and shared spaces. Uh, we've uh, this week added that to the employee and the student code of codes of conduct. Um, we expect that all instructors follow campus restrictions and, and, and support those in, in, uh, uh, in their classrooms, but they, of course, we're gonna allow them to impose some stricter guidelines to make sure that they feel comfortable uh, in, in their classrooms within reason. 
our focus really is on, on flexibility, allowing uh, faculty and students um, in, in what, I'm, what we're calling high flex uh, mode, which is really hybrid and, and, and flexibility. And we're spending a lot of time this summer in training sessions on teaching them exactly what that means. But the way I would describe it to you is, even if we're in, in a face-to-face -face mode, um, if I have a 100-person class, I may have 25 students in front of me, 25 students in the ne classroom next door, and 50 students taking the course remotely uh, on a particular day. And so as a student, I might sit in that classroom on, on Monday. On Wednesday, I might take it in my residence hall, and on Friday, I might sit on the lake. Um, outdoors and, and take the, the, the course. So we're, we're building in that kind of um, flexible modality that uh, supports whether a student can or cannot or doesn't want to uh, be face to face. That's no, no, all. Say you have, go ahead. I dare say you have a big lake to sit out on. It. Yes, you do. A beautiful one. You can see it right behind me. See? <laughs> um, we've also added uh, to support that, that's not an easy task. We've had that, are, are adding technology to 80 classrooms this summer to support that high flex uh, operation because you have to be able to stream from all these classrooms and we simply don't have the, the technology currently uh, there to, to support that. So we're spending a lot of time this summer uh, installing that. And of course, lots of signage and communication about good hygiene, social distancing, safety protocols. We're also as I mentioned, we start on August 19. One of the things we are, haven't decided, but are likely to do is uh, considering canceling our fall break, which is two days, um, and then looking to move to remote instruction just prior to Thanksgiving. And this is a, a conversation all the universities in New Orleans are having, and likely we will all do that. Um, the idea is to finish, um, finish, face to face by Thanksgiving, then go remote, finals would be uh, uh, online or remote as well. And what we're doing is limiting the, the what's called the R not a reproduction number, right? A student goes and interacts with a family member or groups of friends and then brings, comes back to campus, that number dramatically rises. And so we feel that that's a safer uh, approach and uh, the, the city is supporting uh, that move by higher ed collectively. Um, housing for us is, uh, we're actually in a pretty good place uh, relative to some of my, my peers. Our residence halls are single rooms arranged in four person or four room pods. And so they're already singles. And so that, we're not gonna have to change that, but we are gonna pull about somewhere between five and 10% of our rooms offline to make sure we have space for quarantine uh, and isolation as needed. Um, as Dr. Henderson mentioned, there's lots of uncertainty around testing and um, one of my colleagues in Florida was commenting that um, he has a 50,000 student university and he's going to test everyone when they come, come back. I, I just don't know about at least current technology and uh, the, the feasibility of that is uh, uh, tough, for me, tough for me to grasp. Uh, but in the meantime, we are going to have to rely a lot on personal responsibility. And so we have a daily self-assessment survey that before you come on the campus, you have to complete this survey. And it's reported, it basically asks you, do you have a fever, do you have a cough? And it, it's more for your, your self-awareness, but that information is kept in our institutional research so that we have it. And so I'm, we are also limiting the number of people coming on campuses and, and they all come through one entrance and rec we record their name. So I have a strong record should uh, we have to contact trace uh, a, a case. We know who's on campus and what they're there for. And ideally, we'd have an idea of, of uh, any symptoms they were experiencing. We're considering the, the feasibility of doing that in the fall. It's easy to do it in the summer, but if you limit access and start taking names when 8,000 students come back, uh, it becomes a, quite a, a log jam. So we're trying to figure out exactly the feasibility of how that might work. But um, so those are some of the things we're doing. I think general challenges that uh, we continue to face is really just all the uncertainty. Um, and you know, when, when you have so much uncertainty, the way you plan is uh, through lots of scenarios, lots of options, lots of contingency planning that you can move from one plan to another fairly quickly. And um, I think we're also working hard to be very strategic, um, but 
it, through all of this, I think one thing it's required is for us to be nimble. And as you all know, academic institutions by nature are not the most nimble uh, organizations, but that's, uh, I think, something we strive to be and we need to be more nimble uh, in reacting to whatever the landscape looks like at a particular time. And the final thing I'd say is, uh, you know, I appreciate Cami's comments on communication. It has been vital. We've com over communicated um, in some ways. I don't think you can over communicate to our employees and to our students, both prospective students and then our continuing students. Um, one of the concerns among our, our, as I talked to the presidents and chancellors in, in New Orleans areas is, is that students will be students. And when they come back, uh, despite all that we do, will they end up at the boot? If you all know what the boot is, uh, it's a bar uh, that all of our students uh, tend to, to migrate to. Um, and it's closed right now. And so as soon as that opens, I know there's a, a lot of students uh, in New Orleans, but also students that go to other universities and are home for the summer, they're waiting to go to that location. And that's, uh, that's news from my son that I hear. So I'm plugged in that way, but that, that is a concern. And I think we're going to have to work to, as I said, change behavior, uh, particularly around students. John, I think you hit, I hit, you hit the nail on the head with that is, is there's gotta be behavioral expectations and behavioral changes. Uh, you, you know, I, I will tell you that, that uh, I've seen the, the, uh, the videos and pictures on Facebook from, from all over different parts of the country and certainly in Louisiana uh, where we haven't seen a great change in behavior. And, uh, and, and that's certainly a part of the equation that has to be built into the planning. Also, it, it, and, and listen, members, I'm not going to ask all of our presidents to talk through this, but I wanted you to get a flavor of some of the planning that's taking place. You know, I, I, I want to go to, to, to the opposite end of the state, to a more rural area uh, in, in Lincoln Parish. I know that uh, President Gallo is not able to be with us, uh, but Martin Lamell is here. And, you know, at Grambling State, where uh, Grambling had probably uh, the least online delivery infrastructure in place and the task that their faculty and their academic leadership and of course Martin and, and President Gallo did to convert to this online semester was was uh, was especially inspiring. Uh, they also served the largest number of out-of-state students of any of our uh, system institutions and I wanted Martin to talk a little bit about uh, about that to give us a flavor of the distinctiveness of these institutions and why institutional planning within this framework is absolutely essential if we're going to be successful. Martin, I assume you're on the, 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 the call, on the meeting. Good afternoon, Dr. Henderson. I'm hey, here. Hey, my friend. Thank you for the opportunity to speak a little bit about Gremlin's transition and, and really change management agenda as we've navigated this. Mm -hmm. So as, as Dr. Henderson alluded to, a, a very tall order for our faculty and, and provost-led team to transition hundreds of classes to Canvas, our LMS platform, and doing so while navigating and maintaining high customer service with our student population. That student population that almost 50% of them have some level of technology gap, right? Whether they didn't have access to internet resources, at their home or they were missing a laptop or some type of connected device. So we worked hard through partnerships, partnerships like our Friends of Technology Advisory Board that include members who are CIOs and technology leaders at various corporations to start thinking about how do we prepare and equip our students, particularly the incoming freshman class, to be the most tech-enabled class that we've ever had at Grambling. And so we're working diligently right now with a couple of quotes and opportunities around empowering that freshman cohort with laptops so they would be ready to engage in that distance education if need be. All of our courses for the fall planning perspective are hybrid courses. So we're being nimble as Dr. Nicola spoke about, right? Making sure that if and when we need to, the, to do the adjustment, we could do so seamlessly. We certainly are focused on health and safety. One of the partnerships that we're looking at is with the case ambulance, to be able to be our partner in the testing space and certainly looking for 
the rapid testing, as well as the validity of those tests. When we speak about the employee or faculty and staff experience, their health and safety is of top priority as well. Certainly they've reached out with concerns and questions about the summer and about the fall. And so we're actually meeting with a company on Monday for a demo of a technology enabled kiosk that will allow us to do temperature checking as well as link it with our ID card system. Now this will mean that Gremlin will look a little more like Baton Rouge and that you'll need to bring out your ID before you go in a building, but we see it as a necessary step forward to ensure that we've got some protocols in place. And so we really are leveraging every moment to think smarter, right? To diversify our thought and our strategies as we plan for the fall. Our students are excited to return to campus. If you go on any social media platform, you'll see their interest in wanting to return to campus. Our freshman housing is at capacity right now. So we are operating under a waiting list. And so that means for our inventory purposes to appropriately social distance, we really have a lot of work to do there. So we are looking at new apartment complexes within the area, We've got about two or three of those contracts under review, as well as partnering with our hotel entities within the space. So thinking through what the fall will look like, obviously athletics is a, a very vibrant conversation and we're continuing to be on calls with the, the Southwestern Athletic Conference every week so that we're following their lead and following their guidance as we move forward. We are certainly leveraging this moment too for what our primary purpose is and that's education. And so we have four graduate students who are working this summer on a special project for a case study studying COVID-19 and its impact on higher education. And so we want them to be a part of all of our task force conversations. They're meeting with the president, myself and other leaders and really starting to document what from the student experience this pandemic uh, has taught them and ultimately what lessons we can take into the fall. Our provost is looking at the opportunity to do a course on contact tracing. Uh, she's been studying some of the, the coursework at John Hopkins and just finished that course over the last few days. But we're thinking about that as well, as well as maybe a course in the fall on navigating a crisis. Again, we're an institution of higher education and we're positioning ourselves to be active in that conversation. So we certainly appreciate the support of the, the system, the board members, and really collaborating with our peer institutions. I think often Dr. Henderson and team about the work of the For Our Future Conference, right? And a lot of the synergies and relationships and connections that we have today that we would not have had at the level of engagement and strength had we not invested in that earlier on. So it's, it's definitely showing a lot of positive benefits and I know it will continue to be beneficial for us going forward. Martin, well, well done. And uh, I have to, to tell you board members that, that may not have known uh, that the COVID-19 transition this spring occurred uh, in the midst of an on-site SAC COC accreditation visit at, at Grambling State. Uh, and so if, if you think that it is stressful during a normal time, try it during a SACS visit. Uh, it was a highly successful visit, as I understand, from, from Grandma State. And it just, again, it accentuates just how much work was done at that campus. I'm very proud of them. Also want to congratulate, uh, and I think it's appropriate that we're in a Zoom meeting, which is a cloud-based uh, uh, technology. Uh, Grambling's cloud-based uh, uh, Bachelor of Science degree was approved by the Board of Regents today. And so, Martin, congratulations and thank you and President Gallo and, 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 and your whole team for continuing to, to advance that institution. Thank you very much. And, and members, I, I, I want to, we could go campus by campus and, and, and I don't want to do that just, uh, but I, I will tell you, you know, last week, uh, President Bruno and Interim President Litoff and I visited with the task force at ULM and talked through uh, uh, their approach to uh, uh, planning for, for uh, 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 fall of 2020. And it's, and it's a robust planning operation. And, and, and the input from the faculty and staff on that committee was, was invaluable. 
you know, at, at Louisiana Tech, again, I, we get the messages almost daily uh, from President Geis and, uh, and the work that's happening at Tech. And not only just in planning for 2020, but actually, you know, Tech has been integral in planning for all 10 international sites for the uh, Air Force Global Strike Command, a numbered Air Force, and, and helping them analyze data so that they can make informed decisions. You know, uh, Northwestern State was one of the leading institutions in the country in having a pandemic response uh, continuity of operations plan already in place and was able to execute that immediately. Uh, McNeese, I, I'm not sure what they do at McNeese. I'm just kidding. Uh, Daryl Burkell and his team continues to do uh, amazing work there in, in, in preparing for COVID-19 in a way that makes sense within still an economic hotbed of Louisiana. And if you go down into that economic hotbed, inside those plants, there's a lot of them that are operating as if nothing has changed, right? And, and how that puts added pressures on the operation itself. At ULL, there was a great piece in the, uh, the, the clips today about the planning process that's going there. It had numerous, uh, um, uh, some great input from Jamie Bear, their, their CAO there, and of course, uh, uh, President Savoy, who led the entire state through the response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita and salvaged uh, higher education and led to, to some of our best days, I think, ever in terms of policy and, and funding. And of course, as you would expect at Southeastern, uh, 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 the planning process uh, led by Dr. Crane and his team uh, is voluminous and uh, comprehensive and exhaustive. Uh, but I did want to go w just one more campus as an il illustration of the planning as, as to, to Nickel State with Jay Clune. Um, uh, and, and for him to talk about some specific things that are happening there to give you a flavor of what's occurring, specific, specific, specifically when it comes to accommodating students in, in their dormitory space, some of the challenges that have occurred there, uh, and, and some adaptations to the academic calendar that I think make a lot of sense for that institution. Uh, Jay, if you're on the call, that'd be great. Thank you, Jim. Um, I, th I think President Nicola is going to have sponsor graphics soon on his site, getting so impressive. Uh, we have been uh, dealing with uh, bringing back a couple of closed dormitories that have not been used for about five or six years as, uh, as extra space to do just what President Nicola suggested, go to single occupancy rooms and also to have a quarantine hall. And, and that has been a, a quite a quite a quick turnaround for us, but we are starting that work this week. Um, we had a lot of unfinished business from the spring, one of which was to have a, a spring commencement. We started to schedule high schools in our, in our gymnasium at 25%, and we thought that might not look good to our own students. So one of the, in planning for the fall, we, we concluded we had to have a spring summer commencement weekend with smaller ceremonies first. Uh, before we started the fall. So we're going to do that the weekend of August 7th through the 9th. Uh, our fall semester is going to start August 10th. It was going to start August 19th. Uh, as you know, universities across the system and across the country have been, uh, have decided to wrap up all face-to-face -face classes by Thanksgiving break. Uh, we impose upon ourselves a requirement that we complete all classes, all exams, and a commencement weekend before the Thanksgiving holidays. Uh, so that required us to move our start date up to August 10th from the 19th. Uh, it also required us to remove uh, one of our fall breaks. We actually had two in there. And uh, we're still within the SACS minimum for the number of minutes you need in a, in a semester for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday classes. Yeah, important stuff like that, number of minutes. Yes, the minutes. We counted the minutes, and we are it's razor thin, but we, we're getting past that. But we also, we need to keep the fall break and, and, and Saturdays because of hurricane season, right? You might be rescheduling that as well. So our commencement will be held November 21st and 22nd, uh, perhaps in, in smaller units and multiples per day. But we, we just, we were a bit concerned about going online with the angst we caused about not having a spring commencement and trying to have a fall commencement. So that's our plans, at least as of 319 uh, today. Uh, which seems to change. Okay, I That's appreciate it. it. Yes. Appreciate that very much. And, and uh, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I will tell you that, that going forward, uh, you know, I, I, want, I want to give time for the board members to ask questions and, and, and engage in any conversation you would like. Uh, it is our plan going forward to, to make 
a report out, a, a monthly report to the board, updating them on status and, and, and answering questions, and then making it a standing part of our board meetings for the foreseeable future. You know, I think when we named this, uh, this committee the post-pandemic uh, post operations, it might have been a little bit uh, overly optimistic. I think that uh, pandemic and post-pandemic operations might be uh, uh, more appropriate, uh, as, as we certainly will not be post-pandemic uh, uh, soon, or not nearly as soon as we would like. Uh, but I hope that you get a flavor of, of, of how our institutions are putting those four core principles in place. And of course, that one that is paramount to the health and safety of faculty, staff, students, and communities at large. And Mr. Chairman, with that, would, would be happy to entertain any questions from, from board members or from you. Thank you, Jim. I, I would certainly like to comment in uh, commending you and your team, our presidents, for just an immense focus on bringing forth uh, a comprehensive view and plan to address student needs and, and certainly the operational aspect of our, our campuses and our system as a whole. Uh, and I'll certainly defer to all board members who are present. And again, thank every one of you for taking such an interest in being here uh, and prioritizing uh, what I think is gonna be a very difficult to craft a game plan to best address the future and our exposures and needs of others and responsibilities to the same. So with that, Jim, any, any questions from any members? Hey, Mark, just, uh, hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Here a quick question. Just uh, what, what does it look like uh, with regard to enrollment for the fall, <clears throat> fall semester? Just kind of curious because that's going to really drive uh, much of what we are able to do. Thank you for the question, Tom. That's a, uh, that's, that is a key question. We have become such an enrollment-focused institution simply because of the, the disinvestment that occurred on the public funding side for so long. I will tell you that at each of our institutions, uh, the leading indicators, the traditional leading indicators we would look to indicate that enrollment is going to be robust this fall. Challenge with those indicators is that all of the other variables outside of them have changed. And so, so it's, it's hard to predict with any certainty. Uh, when you look at uh, 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 registrations, when you look at new admits, when you look at applications, they're up almost across the board. Uh, we do know that, that there are a number of students that uh, 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 traditionally might have looked elsewhere that may want to stay closer to home, that may want to go to an option that's not as expensive. Uh, that's who we are. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, I've remained bullish on, on an enrollment. I do think that, that it's something we're going to pay very, very close attention to over the next 30 days, and we'll have a much more concrete answer for you at that point. And thanks. And one, one more question, I guess, deals with the, you know, the budget for the upcoming year. Um, if you could comment on that, I know the state is moving toward adopting a budget. I know that there's been... Um, a restoration or at least uh, supplementing the state budget with a lot of the federal funds to mitigate the uh, the impact but I know there there is going to be some impact and uh, I appreciate your comments I'm just curious because I know the budget sometimes we don't learn about it on a campus by campus basis until after the beginning of the fiscal year it just makes and, great sense doesn't it <laughs> yeah it's 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 just hard to set in motion a plan for the upcoming year from a fiscal standpoint, not having that type of knowledge, you know, about what exactly your budget for the year is going to be. So Mr. Kitchen, on the, on the state funding side, uh, uh, the House has passed the budget, which is in, in this case, it's HB 105 by uh, Representative Zerang, uh, but it is currently in the Senate and has not been heard in Senate finance. Uh, since the legislature adjourns on June 1st, uh, I think we, it's safe to assume that we will not have a budget bill come out of this general session uh, and will come out of the special session that begins one minute after the general session ends on, on June 1st. Uh, uh, as the, in the, its current disposition, the budget does maintain full funding for TOPS, uh, but it does cut about $21 million from the form, formula distribution to institutions. Uh, that's hard. Uh, especially since we approached this session as one calling for reinvestment, especially in, in faculty salaries. 
and ensuring that we could be much more competitive for faculty. And so uh, uh, we're going to have to continue to work and advocate with our legislators to fund us with the resources that they have available. Continue to work with our federal delegations who can who are in the in process now of coming up with yet another stimulus bill uh, to support uh, 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 higher education and certainly state governments. And we expect we do see some promise there. Uh, uh, the, 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 the state budget is, is only one piece of the puzzle, right? And we keep talking about uh, the, 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 the paucity of state funding for who we are. You know, last year we got about $217 million for operations for our institutions. They sent about $150 million to retire unfunded accrued liabilities and, and, and post-employment benefits. That tells you how little the state of Louisiana is actually investing in higher education itself and the actual deliver of higher education. That message has resonated. We've got a legislature that fully understands that talent development is essential, that uh, colleges and universities are economic drivers for their regions. I think that message will work. It's the scarcity equation that's gonna work against us. And so uh, well, our, 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 our intent is to be a constant advocacy voice to continue to work with those areas where there are resources to apply them to what we do. The CARES Act funding that came to our institutions earlier this year uh, was about $65 million. $32.5 million of that was earmarked to go directly to students in the form of student aid. And our institutions are in the process of distributing that now. It came, of course, according to a formula established by the U.S. Department of Education. The remainder of that has helped offset some of it, especially the revenue losses associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, refunds, if you will, for, for uh, uh, housing and, and meal plans. Uh, uh, it's not enough. It doesn't cover the total cost, especially when you look at the, uh, the cost associated with construction and costs that we expect to incur going into next year. And so that's one of the reasons why we'll continue to advocate for, for additional federal support to come in to offset that. On the positive side, um, economic projections remain strong, especially going into quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three of next year. So it, my opinion, and of course, as you all know, I'm a glass half full kind of person. I think the financial constraints are going to be short term. I think the larger challenge is going to be how do we respond in preparing Louisianians for a future of work that has only been hastened by the arrival of this pandemic. It's forced us to move more quickly to what we've been predicting and preparing for uh, for the last three and a half years. Uh, that's gonna be the real challenge. And, and finding ways to continue to serve students, many of whom are financially uh, 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 dramatically impacted by COVID-19, the, the pandemic, who have historically been under-resourced as, as a general population in the aggregate, uh, and finding ways to deliver our mission at scale uh, to a larger number of students than ever before. That's gonna be the long-term challenge, and that's our focus. I hope that's fair. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. Yes, sir. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and everyone, uh, this is Sean. I just wanted to uh, congratulate y'all on always doing one hell of a great job. I mean, awesome. Staff, faculty, everybody, super job. Uh, Dr. Clune, I'd also like to ask you the most important question, and that is, how's Boots doing? Hello? Yeah, he had a rough night. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> he, he apparently ate something that didn't agree with him, and uh, we had a rough night, but he's better today. Thank you. Well, good. Tell him I said hello. I will. And, and after that important important segue, uh, Rachel Lodiger had a question on that one. Rachel, it's hard to be more substantive than that. <laughs> Dr. Anderson, she may have had to hop off. I don't see her anymore. You don't she know had her hand raised. Okay. I don't. Uh, she had raised. Oh, no. Let me see. Mr. Robinson has his hand raised and so maybe calling him. Mr. Robinson, please. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Henderson, thank you and the staff for, and the other president and the presidents for uh, very informative uh, information. I know there was a high level uh, presentation and uh, 
we uh, we certainly uh, are delighted to get the information from you all. We would look forward to future presentations where you update us on what's going on and give us a little bit more granular look at what is taking place uh, as we evolve back into this new this new 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 normal that we have to work within. But I had one specific specific question for for Marcus, and maybe you can tell me, Marcus. Or how have you envisioned that we were going to impart social dis distancing into the athletic program, especially mm -hmm. the football, basketball, or the contact sports? Well, that, that's a that's a good question, and we are we are really waiting for uh, for, for guidance from the uh, the athletic uh, divisions to to provide us that guidance on on how uh, we can safely. Uh, tra transition back and, and have social distancing. And it may be a situation where uh, for, for athletic events, uh, you may have uh, football teams that are playing and, and not anybody in the stand. Uh, so, so that guidance is going to have to come uh, from the, uh, the, the different conferences and, and, uh, and, and because the SEC has put out some, some guidance, but we haven't gotten anything uh, clear from uh, from the SWAC or some of the other conferences. And, and if I could the, add, Mr. Robinson. The players, the players themselves uh, are going to be exempt from social distancing, huh? No, 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 no. Because if, if you know, if we're on a football field, it's kind of hard for the guy next across from me or next to me to socially distance from me. That, that's, that's, that's exactly right. And when you're on the bottom of that pile, Right. Uh, you know, I don't know if you'll be wearing the right kind of uh, face mask at that time. You know, those are those are some tremendous questions that, that there's not an easy answer to. I can tell you, you know, I've seen some work from from Brian Maggard and from uh, Tommy McClell and of course Greg Burke at, at, at Natchitoches, uh, Tim Duncan at, at UNO, and, and I could go or, or go at Scott McDonald at ULM. We've got some uh, some some great voices at the table that are leaders in the profession that are talking through this, right? It's not just a competitive piece of it, and it's not just the spectator piece of it. The financial implications of this are a conversation we've got to engage in over these next 30 to 60 days because they're tremendous. And uh, it, when you look at the NCAA, they deliver almost a little over $600 million annually in distributions to institutions. But the majority of that or a sizable portion of that is from having a uh, the spectacle of all spectacles of sports, March Madness, the NCAA basketball tournament. Right. Right. Well, they didn't have it this year, so they dr dramatically lowered their distribution to institutions. has a significant impact on our on our on our institutions. Uh, so that's that is certainly one of the key planning pieces that we have to to engage in uh, with our athletic directors, our coaches, certainly our student athletes as we move through it. You know, and there's one other thing, Mark, is I would like to know. Uh, as you go through your processes, when we get to get down to more of the granular stuff that needs to take care day to day, how are we going to handle campus access? Mm -hmm. Most of our campus has multiple access points. And uh, once you get students on the campus, I don't think you want to have just that ongoing transportation or uh, transporting the people back and forth uh, through the campus. Then how do you deal with your commuter students? People who come for two courses or three courses a day and come back the next day or come back two days later. How do you deal with, you know, do you test those people? I, I'm just raising those questions because those are things that are kind of interesting to me to want to know. And, and, and those are all good questions. And I think those are questions that as, as we move forward and, and the campuses start developing their plans, those are things that they're going to have to have to look at and, and address uh, those items or those issues uh, specific to each of those uh, each of those campuses. So some of our campuses are are fairly open, and it, it becomes relatively difficult to uh, to control access. And then you have some campuses where it begins uh, becomes a, a little easier to control that access. So those are issues that, as they develop their plans, uh, they're going to have to uh, have to address. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Hello? Hey, Jim. Yeah, I, I've got a 
couple comments and a couple questions. The, first of all, thanks to everybody for preparing this presentation, certainly. Um, special, you know, uh, appreciation for the, the work at the campus level. Extraordinary details that y'all are, are, are working with, it, absolutely extraordinary. And every time you listen to something like this, you realize how much more there is to be done. That said, a couple of things. One, the, the documents that you sent out, which appreciate very greatly being able to, to, to kind of pre-read the, the guidelines. And one of them mentions, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it said uh, uh, benchmark actions against peers. And so I'm, I'm entirely for this idea that every institution has to have its own individual circumstance and so on. That said, I'm wondering if the system plans to roll up or have some sort of a matrix. So in all these individual categories that we can collectively kind of compare and understand campus to campus, what is the circumstance? Is that, is that a part of the, 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 the expectation there? Yes, yes, sir. That is absolutely the expectation. And that's why it, like it's, it'll be a monthly report or as we get into it, Jimmy, it may be that it becomes a weekly report, it, depending on the dynamics of circumstance. Right now, the plan is monthly and then for it to be a standing agenda item uh, at, our, at our board meetings when we're in person uh, to really get into a, a deep conversation about this. You know, the, the challenge with this, and, and you understand it as, as well as anybody, the scope of this and the impact on operations is almost incomprehensible to, to those who aren't involved in this business. And, uh, and so, you know, we, uh, I, I don't know that we could ever have a, uh, a comprehensive conversation that covers every aspect of it. Uh, and so, and so benchmarking against peers is one thing to do. And I, I've, I've learned so much, you know, every time I say something and I think I said, Oh man, I've overstepped and I've gone too far with an idea. One of my peers will say something that's even more outrageous. So that's a good thing to, to benchmark against that. But, but, but some of the activities we're, we're learning a lot from some of the things, Tim White at, in Cal state, you know, his approach, uh, that what they uh, put out as their report, we, we gleaned a lot from that. We also learned some things that they're doing in, 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 in Georgia, for instance, and, and other places. But I think really it's, it's, it's our own intellectual capacity that has led to what I think is probably the most comprehensive and progressive approach. Right. Well, it's, it's not, in my mind, it's not simply, you know, taking the best practices or trying to take a good thought from someone else and applying it. It's, I think we're going to be very uh, open uh, to finger pointing or, you know, students comparing why can they do this at LSU? Why can they do this at Southern? Why can they do this at Grambling? Why can they do this at Nichols? And, you know, we can't, yeah. you know, and, and so to be able to understand or at least put it into some, you know, bigger picture, I think will be important. Um, to that end, I'm curious, the other day when it was announced that the UL system, one of the first systems in the country to announce it was going to be online in the fall and you did a good job, Jim, on CNN. That was impressive. But but on our local news, it was interesting because they were reporting out this, that there was going to be on and so on. And uh, when when pressed, they, they said that, uh, of course, this was all subject to the approval of the board. The individual UL Lafayette plan was subject to the board. So I'm, I'm wondering, what does that mean? Is that Was that accurate reporting? Was that not? What does approval mean? Are we, as board members, supposed to be understanding all these finite detailed plans how, how does that work no and, and i don't think as a board you can be expected to, to to be able to to do that and it's certainly not an effective way for for institutions to be nimble enough to meet their the demands Absolutely. and to be yeah. granular enough to meet their demands so so i so i think some of that is is catch-all language that is used uh uh in in media you know one of the 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 the, the at the the cnn interview that you mentioned uh if you listen to the interview, I think we had a lot of opportunity to go into some of the nuance of what we're doing. Uh, but if you just read the, the, the piece at the bottom of the screen, it, it, it pretty overly simplifies everything that's going on. And, and, and that's, I guess that's a, it's part of the messaging piece that, that we'll continue to, to fine tune and get right. Uh, there are going to be things that will require board approval uh, as we go forward. Uh, and, and those are things that are in our current bylaws, right, in their current approach to, to, to board approvals. And I think there'll be aspects of plans that'll come forward for that. But for the most part, these plans are going to follow uh, the, this, uh, this framework that we've put out there. Um, 
we hope that uh, I can envision, and perhaps this is something we need to do, is maybe have the board codify this plan with approval, and maybe we make edits to it based on your feedback now and between now and June, and that be what the board approves. I don't know that that's necessary, other than it being a symbolic vote of confidence in the, in the plan going forward. Mr. Well, my question is, uh, we've heard from several of the presidents, have all of the universities provided you with very distinct plans of what and how they're moving forward? No, ma'am. All of them have, have provided uh, uh, input on their planning process, but I think each of them is in a different stage in that planning process as they go forward. Uh, they'll all, uh, uh, most of them are pretty advanced in, in terms of where they are simply because of time. Where you, here we are almost in June now, and so they've advanced pretty quickly. As they develop these plans, of course, they'll be uh, re reporting to us, uh, uh, not for approval, because there's such distinct constituencies that they have to work with to, to develop these plans. Uh, these guidelines will help uh, uh, provide that framework that these plans are developed and finalized. And then, of course, the reporting mechanism that we put in place is going to be essential. Another question real quick. So um, will there be funds provided to each of our universities for, you know, the, the mask, the plexiglass, the, the hand sanitizing stations, all that? Or do they have to come up with each of those out of their own budgets? So we're, we're working uh, closely with uh, the Department of, of Health and Hospitals at the state level, at the, at the uh, federal level, we, uh, Cam and I were on a call with Senator Cassidy's office talking about, and with Ramesh Kalaru from UL Lafayette, talking about uh, testing uh, capacity, but not just the testing capacity for us to test, but our ability as academic institutions then to utilize that testing data to inform public health decisions and how that's worthy of a federal investment. Uh, as of now, there is no single source of funding uh, for that. And so uh, the CARES Act funding that we have is, is, is woefully inadequate for us to do this at appropriate level, in my opinion. Jim, do you anticipate or expect that there will be any system protocols that will be established as minimums uh, in, in terms of health or safety issues? Yes. Um, and I, again, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> in any way, shape or form trying to suggest anything in particular, but for instance, if, um, you know, X number of individuals on a camp in a campus community are tested positive or X percent or X something, does that trigger something to be done? Or with this, you know, suggestion or Lola mentioning as she was talking, the, the idea of the PPE or, you know, sanitation stations or sanitizing stations and so on, will there be an expectation that you know, there's a certain something that is done in certain areas. Yeah, yes, and, and, and Jimmy, we, we have gotten some preliminary guidance from uh, the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals. Uh, it came to all of us through the Board of Regents. So uh, Commissioner Reed, uh, Interim President Galligan, uh, President Belton, President Sullivan, and I speak weekly. Uh, and so that helped develop this document that is public health guidance. That's what provides those those standards, right, that will say, you know, the capacity of a room, uh, mask required or not required, and they provide a minimum level, appropriate, informed, but a minimum standard. And of course, an institution is always able to be more stringent than that. Uh, for instance, I, I believe in the in the in the, uh, the draft guidance in phase two or phase three, face masks are strongly recommended. Uh, I know that if 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 I'm an institution. I would err on the side of in the classroom, face masks are required through phase three and until the vaccine is, is, is implemented. I think a, a campus community, depending on their demographics, can go to that extent. But the minimum uh, criteria, the minimum enforceable guidelines are being provided by public health officials. You, you mentioned that the mask question and, and, and that came up earlier when I was listening to the UNO and um, as, as a former Dean of Student Personnel and, and responsible for administering the code of student conduct when it was mentioned that, that uh, you know, wearing masks could possibly or is going to be put in as a part of a code of student conduct. I'm thinking to myself, goodness, so if someone doesn't wear it, they're subject to disciplinary proceedings. Uh, if so, you know, who would be responsible for 
you know, bringing that student to whatever discipline there would be done. And is this going to be, again, a system-wide circumstance or is that going to be, you know, handled strictly by the campuses? Again, I'm not weighing in on an answer or whatever. It's just, uh, it, it, it brings to mind, you know, some really interesting possibilities. It does. And it, capt and it captures just how complex this really is. And, and you're right. And, and when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to the face mask issue, you know, is there, is there a distinction between a, a face mask as you're walking across campus, a face mask in a public building that's open to the public to come in, and then a classroom setting, right? And I think there are distinctions in that. And, and Brandon DeQueer uh, uh, from DeQueer, Clark and Adams has given us some guidance on that. Uh, that will and, and public health officials have given us some guidance on that. Uh, those are all part of the, the puzzle that has to be put in place if we're going to be able to open our campuses in adherence to those four guiding principles that we have at, at the top of the document. When, when, and again, the, 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 in that guiding principle document, which I, again, I really appreciate your, your, you and your staff putting it together, there, there is some mention of some specificity, you know, the, 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 rec the, the reference to the 50 uh, percent or the 50 per size of the classroom, you know, whichever is less, of, so on. Will there be more of that in that we as a board will be looking at in terms of these specific things or is that that was put in there just as an example? I think those are the guidelines that, that we'll put forth as a board. Okay. All of those guidelines also say in adherence to uh, uh, public health guidelines as well. And that's the piece that's being finalized by LDHH. We'll have a, 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 a tentatively scheduled, I don't know if it's been finalized yet, next week, uh, a, a public seminar, if you will, for all of our institutions to engage in with our public health officials. Well, they'll go through some guidelines as they continue to, uh, to refine their guidelines. You know, if we think back, uh, we, we thought that surface air contamination was a major source of transmission. And now we've determined that, that fortunately, it's really not except for some surface areas and surface areas like uh, handles coming out of restrooms, for instance, are, 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 are a, a primary source of surface transmission. But a desk, for instance, is really not. And so what are then the implications for us in terms of practice and sanitation? And those are the things that they're refining that give us some really good granular information about this. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm going to go ahead and mark it, Mr. Chairman. Questions. Thank you, Jim. Jimmy, I appreciate your insight. I know you, I do have a question, Jimmy, for you. Uh, certainly knowing that you have a broad experience, you're participating with many others. When you look at the things that we're doing and you look at, and I, I fully realize that this is going to be a fluid process that we're going to have to have really good adaptive capabilities to maintain relevance and good application. Are you seeing some things that you might consider as real paramount to bring in an optimized, I guess, baseline and then continued growth of this plan? Or some best practices maybe that uh, you've recognized through your other uh, interactions? Mark, I, first of all, I, I, I appreciate you, you even suggested that I'd have some special set of knowledge or be able to pinpoint in this particular circumstance, <laughs> but that, that, that certainly is not the case. I think that just as each one of our campuses is different as individual specific settings, uh, every state and the, the people that I'm talking with and working with in multiple, multiple states are facing the same circumstance and situation that it depends. And it depends not only on the, you know, the, the demographics of the, of the, of the, you know, the state or the system or the, the campus, the geography, the location, um, it has to do with the, certainly the politics within. And as, as I'm sitting here listening to the mask situation and the politicalization of the mask, you know, it's something that I think has to be, thought about, understood that what does it mean and how does it react? And that's why the, you know, those types of things. But the bottom line is, I think that my observation of what this system, this system staff, certainly the presidents 
that have been reporting out from my knowledge of, of reading some documents, you know, internally, I think this system is, is doing a heck of a job. I think that the, the thoroughness, the detail, the, the, you know, not waiting to be told, you know, getting in and doing, um, it's not going to be perfect. And uh, I think that, that the more that can be, you know, uh, said and brought together uh, in a communication sense is, is what's going to be needed. I, I appreciate Cami and, and the others talking about the internal and external communication. Um, straddling the line, I, the, the, one of the, the most difficult things that I'm hearing from other leaders is trying to be honest about the circumstance in terms of the, the dire uh, consequences, the fiscal you know, realities that s certain institutions are facing. And, and how appropriators need to understand that we really do have a huge, huge crisis, but at the same time, not wanting to convey to the general populace or to potential students or current students that there is, uh, you know, a, an emergency that would prevent them from continuing, which would just exacerbate, you know, the fiscal, you know, circumstances. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing. I've, I've been on multiple calls the last 10 days on this communication challenge on, on how do you do it effectively. And again, I think that this system and this board and, and, and certainly the institutions are doing a great job of that, trying to make that balance. Um, I think as board members, I'm hoping anyway, we can continue to, to be a good sounding board and, and, and listen, you know, certainly put the faith in the staff, put the faith in the, in the institutional workers, and certainly bringing forth as we hear either individually or collectively, you know, a, you know, a possible practice. I guess that's why I, I definitely wanted to, or hoped that we would see a roll up or be able to, to do some comparison of some you know, situations and then certainly at that time can weigh or compare them to other either systems within the state, outside the state and so on. But I, anyway, I hope that- hey, Jimmy, sense. thank you very much. And, and again, I, you know, I agree, we're gonna see some evolving aspects to what our current plan is. And we know we're gonna adapt and continue to be uh, at the forefront of doing what's best. Uh, I, I particularly like to, would like to thank everyone for participating today, having no other questions. You know, we obviously listened to some insightful plans from the presidents. It's evident that, you know, the presidents, the staff, our team are working to develop the best and safest pathways for the faculty, students, staff, and parents, you know, and all of our stakeholders. We appreciate the expertise and experience as we work to support you. Our next board meeting, just as a reminder, is scheduled for Thursday, June 25th. We'll keep you posted as to the format, and hopefully we'll have some updates in advance uh, for you. Uh, is there any other business to come before the board at this time, before this committee? Hearing none, if I may have a motion and second to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Mr. Murphy. Second. Second by Ms. Donahoe. Uh, Carol, if you could call the roll. Yes. Uh, Mr. Romero? Yes. Mr. Carter? He had to step out, Carol. Oh, okay. Dr. Clark? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Rob Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Salter? Um, Mr. Crawford is in is there, I think. Um, Ms. Lodiger? Ms. Methvin? Yes. Dr. Condos? And I think that's everyone, and it's unanimous. Thank you, Carol. We stand adjourned. All the best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.